Once upon a time, you were in perfect harmony with the greater scheme of things. A happy prisoner of the corner rhythms. An average, everyday dope fiend. Devoted to the singular pursuit of the perfect blast. But no fairy tale ever lasts. And finally, without warning, you hit bottom. Only bottom turns out not to be a place or a particular point on any street by street this way to hell compass. It is instead the gradual yet inescapable feeling of horror that leads any drug addict to the most gut-wrenching, agonizing moment of revelation. You are stunned. You have a right to be. Truth be told, you didn't know you were heading this way. You certainly didn't see the signs, nothing that might have told you to ease up a bit. For years, you've been about the business of obliterating yourself. Now, without any justification whatsoever, you're suffering through a prolonged bout of self-awareness. When the initial shock passes, you try that which has always worked best. Denial. But even as you drag your ass out to a corner for the day's jumpstart, the back of your mind holds to a sickening fear that no chemical concoction can rid you of this feeling, this strained sense that you've reached an end. A half hour later, while those around you are deep in the throes of the latest spider bag offering, you sit there in the back of the shooting gallery like an old radio with a slow leak, helpless as your high seeps out. The bottom is the fiend's worst case scenario. Worse than any back alley beating. Worse than standing shackled in front of a surly district turnkey while some fresh out of the academy roller strings your five vials into some kind of kingpin charge. Worse even than sitting on one of those plastic chairs in the university hospital emergency room, half listening as a resident presses the phone number and address of the clinic into your hand, reassuring you all the while that with proper care, you can still get some good years from your body. As a soldier, you learn long ago to deal with the stuff of beatings and arrests. A ruined liver, endocarditis, the bug, these were the givens, the acceptable hazards on the road to oblivion. In the end, you reckoned such setbacks, if you reckoned anything at all, as fresh and viable reasons to keep faith with rule one and get the blast. Fuck it, you learn to yourself. No one's perfect. No one lives forever. But the bottom is a different dimension entirely. A state of mind with a texture unlike anything you've ever encountered. It's beyond the horror of the snake. Beyond even those strange junkie dreams, those recurring nightmares of physical need in which you land in your favorite needle palace, mix the powder and water, and no matter how many matches you fire, the shit just won't cook up. It's beyond the worst tricks and lies, beyond those times when some smarter or hungrier player runs a game, or switches a spike, and what you get for your effort is a sprinkle of water. Even in those fevered, bowel-breaking moments, you've managed to regroup, to somehow get yourself back out there and manufacture another 20 on the hype. The process of revelation might take you a couple of days, maybe even a week, but eventually it sinks in that no combination of vials and bags, capers and games can carry you past this feeling. Denial won't play anymore. Everything is turning flat.
you watch as all your defenses crumble, replaced by a host of raw and alien emotions. Shame, disgust, and an almost overwhelming weariness dominate your every waking moment. Finally, you understand that the bottom is a forced move, not so much a choice as the end of all choice. Your path is set, and all you can think to do is try to find some help. But the very idea of help is so far beyond the established corner universe that at first you can't even imagine where to look. Maybe you try to do it on your own, holding up in some basement with an old blanket wrapped around you, fighting the sickness and solitude, waiting a couple of days before you have strength enough to drag yourself down the street, past the touts, to a church basement or rec center, where you can try your hand at the 12-step I am powerless over my addiction philosophy. If you can't handle that, and not many can, then your last best hope is to know someone somewhere who knows someone somewhere else who got into a program and came out the other side. Find the right someone, and chances are you might end up with a phone number. Call that number, and you might make it to a waiting list. Endure the wait, and after a month, or two, or four, you might be rewarded with a bed of your own, a clonidine patch, some Motrin or Tylenol, and a physician's assistant or nurse's aide to watch over you in your misery. You're in treatment, and the bottom has brought you here. Without that down-in-the-hole grounding that takes the joy out of the strongest file, you would not have gotten this far. But as days pass in the detox center, you begin to see it as more than the bottom. Having given yourself over to something external from and opposed to the corner itself, you believe it's fair to take some credit for having attempted this journey. For you, a weary soldier, treatment seems a choice. You chose. Looking back, you want to believe this. Those with their hands at the throttle, the politicians and commentators, the cops and lawyers and social theorists, pretty much believe the same thing. They, too, feel as though they've chosen, when in fact their crusade has simply grounded on a bottom all its own. After declaring the prohibition, after mobilizing, after filling prisons and rewriting laws and spending billions, those responsible for waging war on the American culture of drugs have come to the same belated conclusion, albeit after a quarter century of denial, as any dope fiend who gives up the fight. 25 years ago, the road taken was that of drug task forces in kingpin statutes, in international interdiction. The dollars went to drug enforcement agents and prosecutors in prisons. When the dollars weren't enough, the laws were changed to make the dollars do more. Mandatory minimums, civil forfeitures, the degradation of the Fourth Amendment. These became the new weapons. For a quarter century, the drug warriors have ratcheted up the conflict, always with the promise that a little more effort, a little more pressure, can't help but have the necessary impact. Their Old Testament approach has been singular, focused, specific. It's a fine old American strategy. Stick first care it later. Now, with the end game at hand, the numbers in cities like Baltimore are too hopeless. 
the open-air drug market's too numerous to justify the stick. Now, with the drug culture fully entrenched, the average Baltimore police commander has learned enough to argue that while all the arrests and sweeps and seizures can't win the war, they nonetheless have a purpose. No longer does law enforcement pursue street-level drug sellers and users merely to punish them. The stat game has become a means to drive lawbreakers toward treatment. Still and always is the stick first. But now at least the drug war has a carrot as well. Talk nowadays with any police professional or prosecutor in a city with a significant drug-involved population and what comes back is likely to be an admission 25 years too late that our society cannot merely arrest its way out of the problem. Talk to those who have invested their careers in the drug war and they'll respond with an argument not for change but for something that amounts to a redefinition of the status quo. By this new reckoning, the criminal pursuit of those along Fayette Street is now more essential than ever because the pursuit attacks demand and drives users toward drug treatment. In this new vision, treatment, education, and law enforcement are joined in a synergistic new entity. Instead of trying to sell the numbers game of street-level arrests to an increasingly cynical public, drug policymakers and police commanders now argue about a nobler purpose. They're not chasing down lost souls for whom jail space no longer exists. They are, instead, guiding those souls back toward a therapeutic solution. Better than the usual pretrial detentions in district court arrangements, the possibilities for the arrestee can now extend to a special drug court and a sympathetic judge ordering residential detox and rehabilitation. Thanks to this redefinition, the chase seems to make sense again. By a quick fix in the terminology, the war and the warriors are once more necessary except for this. Take a walk through a crowded detox facility in Baltimore. To be sure, the dormitory beds and meeting hall are filled, and filled to a great extent with court-ordered patients. Similarly, it's no surprise to see many of these patients parroting a drug-free ideology as if it means something to them. Yet, when the surface is scratched, it becomes entirely apparent that there is no real connection between stick and carrot. Those who are here because a judge ordered them here, those who have been given a choice of either five years with the Department of Corrections or full compliance with a program of drug counseling and rehabilitation are merely taking up beds, biding time, and looking for any chance to slip free. No court order can override the corner rules if a person is about the corner. No judge can tell a man to change his most basic desire if the man himself sees no cause for change. The drug counselors, the best of them anyway, know this. They regard those clients sent by way of the city's drug court or sentencing judge's probation requirements as long shot cases. A few might actually respond to the new regime of counseling and group therapy in Narcotics Anonymous Confessional. But in those instances, the court referral cases change because they are ready to change not because society wills it. As for the rest, they play at recovery until the probation requirements are fulfilled 
or until the hunger is too much. Then it's out the front door and down to the nearest corner. So the court-ordered pretenders soon fall away, leaving only those who arrive at this opportunity and then cling to it by their own act of will. These people don't seek change because drugs are unlawful or prohibited or subject to the condemnation of others. Redemption for them is essential because they have seen and felt and tasted bottom. For too many years, they have been dismantling their lives one blast at a time, shedding friends and relatives and ultimately themselves. Now, by their own volition, they are returning to ask for the alternative. And what exactly is the alternative? On the high end, perhaps, where Blue Cross Blue Shield still pays, all the deductible drug treatment might resemble a comprehensive, carefully structured program for reintegrating vulnerable, dependent personalities into the community. In places where real money is spent, a great deal of therapy is usually assured. But the public drug treatment effort, when it's available at all, isn't the full tilt. Betty Ford is my salvation kind of detox. It's mostly outpatient treatment. Or, for the more fortunate, it's three, or five, or maybe even 28 days of in-house treatment, followed by some group therapy. In the N.A. Creed, repeated three or four times a day until it becomes rote. For those who emerge from the inner city corners, nothing is there to help them after the first few moments of stability. And no one will suggest that a used-to-be dope fiend from West Baltimore is any more welcome in the other America than he was before he fired that first blast treatment may be capable of telling people that once they finished 28 days off the street they are cured of their physical addictions and they are therefore in recovery but it cannot tell them who they are or where they might go to find something better after four days in mercy hospital's detox ward or four weeks in brc's dormitory what remains for the fiend to hit bottom and bounce is to step back into the streets and walk past the same drug markets, tracing the thin line that carries him from one N.A. meeting to the next. He goes from rec centers to church basements to elementary schools, chasing the same words and phrases and imagery clinging to the stories of other fiends. He catches two or three or four meetings a day, however many are required to keep him from scratching at the empty place in his soul. Narcotics Anonymous is the church of last resort in urban America. It provides a daily religious rite that brings the corner survivors into houses of worship albeit through the basement doors. Above them, the sanctuaries stand, mostly empty, save for Sundays. But down below, amid the linoleum tails, tiles and folding chairs and Bible classrooms, is a religion practiced damn near every day. We humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings down in the catacombs, day and night, the steps are read and the traditions reaffirmed. Confessions are made. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Key rings are distributed, one day clean, one week clean, six months clean. Trinkets held precious by men and women who are on a hero's journey, who will embrace at the night's end 
and walk out onto the same streets that once devoured them. We made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends. Down here, at least, there is the camaraderie of shared endurance, the sense of being among other survivors of the same slow motion slaughter. This much is ready and waiting for those who come off the corner. Our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends on NA unity. To the extent that anything in the drug treatment firmament actually works, this does. Though there are many at a Narcotics Anonymous meeting who need to have their court papers signed, who are required to prove to an outside authority that they have attended so many meetings a week, the same rule applies. Those who are here as prisoners of the drug war haven't a prayer, but those who are doing it for themselves might just make it. They're the ones compelled by the horror of reaching bottom. They're the ones who have learned to trust only in humility, in an almost instinctive sense of their own weakness. If you are one of those, if after a week or three of meetings you are still up to it, still determined not to consign what remains of your life to the pavement, you might look around and take stock of your fellow travelers. It's a mixed bag of souls, the weary in need of a temporary rest, the desperate, frightened by a near miss, the game runners, busy building a pre-sentencing pretext. And there are also a few others like you, humbled and vanquished, men and women so seared by the coroner's power that this time they might just make a year or two clean. Many are detox veterans, wearing the chevrons of past campaigns. Nine times, 16 times, 22 times. Some have lost count of how many times they've struck bottom, surrendered in their hearts, gone through sickness and therapy and meetings only to sail out into the ether and get captured once again in the corner orbit. You look at them and calculate your own chances. The young ones don't come, or those who do come arrive sullen and disconnected, waiting only until the end of the meeting and a chance to have their court slips signed. For them, the full-blown nightmare has yet to be imagined, much less lived. A fiend can't sense the bottom until he spent years in service of a corner, misusing all his friends, discarding his family. At 21 or 25, a dope fiend hasn't been beaten down nearly enough to begin questioning the corner construct. He still has years of free falling, a decade, perhaps, of game running and lie telling before he feels anything solid beneath him. If you're ready, though, you'll take what's offered. You'll recite the steps, the traditions. You'll hear testimony, and when the time comes, you'll tell your own story, sparing nothing. You'll pick a mentor and then mentor someone else. You'll sit through daily gatherings, chain smoking with a hundred others, accepting styrofoam cups of coffee in one whatever keychains, as if these things were the blood and body of Christ himself. For a long time, for longer than you thought possible, the meetings will be your life. Or not. The corner is still there. The rules are still the same. At any point in the long struggle, you can miss a meeting or two, or ten, 
you can discover that what you thought was the bottom was not really bottom at all. That there are depths to which you will still need to descend before you can again think about change. You can fall in one thoughtless moment or after days of deliberate and conscious thought, telling yourself all sorts of happy lies in order to get yourself through the door of a shooting gallery and take the spike in your hand. You can kill yourself that way too, going back out into the corner mix after months in the church catacombs, firing what used to be your usual dose and discovering in one world-shattering moment that all your heroin tolerant cells are missing, that your cleaned up self isn't yet ready for 30 of a spider bag all at once. Or you can slouch forward, plugging away from one meeting to the next, until you finally reach that pivotal point where your strength comes as a surprise, where you can tell yourself that your desire to stay clean is equal or better of your hunger. Only then, when you are at last ready to look past a life of meetings, do you come to the next chasm. What, you finally ask yourself, do I do now? Your entire recovery, all that passes for drug treatment in this country has been about defining what you don't want to be, what you fear and dread and need to avoid. You were a drug addict. You are now a recovering addict. Beyond that, you have no idea what to say about your life. Because even if your bottom was real, and even if you've managed to heed its warning and stay clean, what remains for a 35 or 40 year old survivor for whom the corner world has been home? You've lived by manipulation, by ignoring your pain and the pain of others, by invoking the dope fiend move as the solution to every problem. Now. All of that must be abandoned at the threshold of some other barely imagined way of living. To survive at Fayette and Mount, you had to get over on someone else every damn day, and you got to be good at it. But to apply the rules of the corner to any other world invites only frustration and failure. You're supposed to trade your dope fiend skills for what? Humility? Servitude? Minimum wage? Giving up the drugs was hard enough. Giving up the hustle is harder still. And if you do manage it, all you've done is come to the end of the beginning. What's left is the closest thing to impossible. Having put the drugs away and turned your back on the corner, you are left to face life. And this is the part of the journey no one mentions when they theorize about drug treatment or recovery or rehabilitation. You weren't really running to the vials, at least not in the beginning. You were running away from the very same life that you are now challenged to discover and examine. After years in the fog, you are back where you started. Older, perhaps wiser, but still tangled up in the remnants of what had been an unfulfilled existence. Your body is clean, your mind is clear, but none of that is much help when the pieces of a broken life are dumped on the table in front of you. Yes, indeed, you had some problems. There they are, still awaiting your considered attention. The people with the sticks and the carrots, 
the ones who used to talk arrest stats and now talk treatment. They don't know quite what to say to you about any of that. They know what they don't want you to do. They don't want you to take drugs or sling vials or break into parked cars and rip out the radios. They don't want you to rob people or shoot people or hijack their luxury sedans when they stop for gas. They don't want dope fiends. And in an abstract way, they've shown their commitment by spending billions to stop you from being a dope fiend. Beyond that, they have nothing much to say. So welcome back to a culture that still hasn't found a use for you and your kind. This is America, where the West Baltimores exist in social and political isolation, where a good 10% of the population is no longer required by the economic engine, where there will always be those for whom not only a modicum of material success, but relevance is unlikely. You were born for Fayette and Mount. You went there, and at this point, the only surprise is that you survived long enough to want something more. If you went back there now, a last visit, perhaps. If you walked 20 blocks due west from the city's downtown to Mount Street and found the sage idiot manning his post then you could state your case i've been a dope fiend you say i'm tired you'd say i'm trying to stop you'd say and the sage idiot on the corner would surely look at you and offer a cold question that points very close to the truth why and damned if you could answer